Okay, Stephen Sen here, and I'm going to talk about uh, N of 1 trials, random effects, and shrinkage estimators, and uh, how we can try and use these for two particular purposes. So, first of all, an acknowledgement. This is presented on behalf of the IDEAL project, so we'd like to acknowledge our funding from the European Union 7th Framework Program, and also to say that some of the work is uh, joint with Artur Araujo in my group, and Sonia Leite, who was formerly my group, and Stephen Julius, who's also at Sheffield University. Now, the, the Food and Drug Administration has a definition of a rare disease, and that's one affecting fewer than 200,000 people in the US. And I'm going to be talking about the use of N of 1 trials when we have very few patients. But I'm also going to be talking about them when we are going to personalize treatments. But of course, from one point of view, as soon as we start talking about personalizing treatments, then we're talking about rare diseases in the sense that we believe that each individual patient has his own personal condition which might require some personal treatment. So there is some link between the two. Nevertheless, what we're going to see is that there are slightly different attitudes in the way in which we analyze a trial depending on which particular objective we're trying to reach. So the diagram on the right shows what an N of 1 study might look like. This one is very small. It's only got two patients. In practice, we would have very many more patients. And these particular patients are going to be treated in a number of cycles. In each cycle, they're going to receive two treatments. So in total, each patient will be treated on six occasions, which we might refer to as periods. And the particular diagram there shows that we've randomized the order of the treatment. So for example, patient number one has been given treatment A, then followed by treatment B in cycle one, treatment A followed by treatment B in cycle two, and then in cycle three, the cycle has started out with treatment B and A has followed, and so forth. And the general idea is that we could randomize uh, patients to treatment within cycles, each pair of treatments appearing within each cycle. There are other sorts of design that are possible. We could decide to not use the uh, option of having things paired in cycles and maybe just have three times A and three times B in any order, for example. But this is one of the common designs that has been used in the few occasions that N one trials have been used so far. So what this implies, of course, is that there are two to the k possible sequences for any given patient. Now, the value of an N of 1 trial like that is that you can, first of all, study patients many times, or at least a few times, so that gives you more data. And secondly, also, because each patient acts as his or her own control, you eliminate a component of variation that you would see in a parallel group trial. So the net result is that you get rather more precise inferences. However, one of the problems is that it's only possible for chronic diseases. You can't really apply this sort of design when you have patients who are likely to die, for example, or when you have patients who are likely to get better and not need any further treatment at all. So these are the two particular reasons that I'm going to highlight in the talk for conducting N of 1 trials. And I'm going to assume that the disease is stable. On the left-hand side, we have the case where we have rare diseases. So patients are few or otherwise difficult to recruit. It's simply hard for us to get enough patients to study. We know that within patient studies are more efficient. And increasing the number of periods uh, allows us to increase the number of observations. So we therefore reduce the variance. So that's one of the attractions, if you like, for conducting N of 1 trials. On the right-hand side, we have the other use to which they can be put. So here, the idea is that what we would like to do is we would like to try and discover to what extent it is the case that the response to treatment varies from one patient to another, and furthermore, see if we can find some way of personalizing the medicine. Can we use the information that we get across all patients, but also for individual patients, to say something about what will be good for one particular individual. And it turns out that what we really need is we need designs which each patient is treated at least twice, or at least that's the best, <clears throat> the best sort to have, at least twice on each treatment is a good idea. 
So in order to explain that last point, I'm going to invite you to consider a thought experiment. I'm going to imagine a crossover trial in hypertension. And the patients will be randomized to receive an ACE2 inhibitor or placebo in a random order. Then I'm going to do it again. So the basic idea is that each patient does the crossover twice. And this is very important because it's going to enable me to get two separate estimates of the treatment effect for each patient. Essentially, I'll be able to do it once in the first cycle and once in the second cycle because in each of the two cycles, the patient will have been treated twice. And the idea is what I can then do is I can compare each patient's response under an ACE2 to placebo. So here's an illustration of the possible sequences I could use. Sequence one is one in which a patient receives treatment A in period one, followed by treatment B in period two. Then in uh, the second crossover, the patient in period three, that is, would receive A and would then in period four receive B. So that's one of the possible sequences, A, B, A, B. Second sequence, of course, is B, A, B, A. The third one is AB and then reversing the order BA. And the fourth one starts with the order BA and then reverses it into, into AB. But I'm going to assume for the moment that period effects are not important. In fact, to all of this talk, I'm not going to pay any attention to period effects. They can be <coughs> eliminated if one wants to. But I'm going to assume that what's really important is to achieve some sort of local control. And within each cycle, what we're going to do is we're going to eliminate what any particular effect there might be by subtraction. And I'm going to assume that I've got a series of uh, measurements for each patient. I'm going to have two attempts to look at the difference between B and A. Now, on the left-hand side, rather complicated plot I'm going to take you through. What I've plotted on the x-axis is the result from the first crossover. So it's the difference between the two treatments. And I've arbitrarily decided, uh, bearing in mind that uh, many people seem to like dichotomies, I've arbitrarily decided to uh, label minus five as being an interesting response. So here we have a difference of five millimeters in mercury, in diastolic blood pressure, and there's a vertical line which goes up from the point minus five on the x-axis. However, I've got two estimates of the difference between B and A, and so I've also got a y-axis. What I'm going to do is I'm going to plot every patient. I'm going to identify that particular patient on the scatter plot by the difference that there was between B and A on the first crossover and the difference that there was on the second crossover. So every particular point in the scatter diagram represents one particular patient. Now, what I've done is I've labeled here in blue those patients who, by this particular definition I've used, were seen to be responders on both occasions. That's to say, looking at the x-axis, the value was minus 5 or less. The difference was minus 5 or less. But also looking at the y-axis, the difference was minus 5 or less. So any particular patient that I can plot in that particular space is one who was observed to respond on both occasions. If I have a look at the uh, top right hand uh, point on the scatter plot, I then see some red crosses. These are individuals who fail to respond on either occasion. And what I have in orange are patients who responded on one occasion but not the other. So for example, in the, on the right hand side, below the minus five millimeter line, I have patients who fail to respond on the first crossover but responded on the second. And on the other hand, to the left of the vertical line, the vertical dashed line, then in that case, I have patients who, and above that line, above the horizontal line at minus five, I have patients who responded on the first crossover, but not on the second by this particular definition. The solid black lines, by the way, represent the average response over all patients. So for these particular patients, then the average response was a difference of minus 10 millimeters of mercury. And you can see a vertical line, a thick black line at minus 10, and also a horizontal line at minus 10. On the right-hand side, I've drawn a histogram. 
And I've also drawn a histogram below the diagram and together with a smoother. And what this shows is the marginal distribution. It's the marginal distribution of the difference in treatment effect. And had I only one, one, run one crossover, that is all I would be able to see. I would be able to see, in fact, the one that's at the bottom. I would not be able to see the scatter plot. So here what we see in this particular case is there seems to be a reasonable correlation between results in the first crossover and results in the second crossover. And certainly what we can say is response in one crossover is predictive of a response in another. And so it seems to be the case that for this particular series of N of 1 trials that we've run, we can say that there is indeed a personal element of response to treatment. However, the second crossover, uh, the second diagram, the one on the right-hand side now, shows what might have happened. Here we have a case where I've simulated no correlation whatsoever. So I've got a circular scatter of points. Whether a patient responds on one occasion or another is completely, is completely unpredictive of whether they re respond subsequently. All that we can say here is that the treatment works on average, and then beyond that, there seems to be a large amount of scatter, and this might just be due to measurement error of some particular sort or the fact that patients are particularly unstable. Again, I've drawn the marginal distribution um, underneath and at the right-hand side. So the two marginal distributions for each of the two pairs of periods are given here. However, right at the very bottom now, I show you the situation that I would see had I only run one crossover. And I invite you to agree with me, it's pretty difficult to tell which of the two histograms that particular diagram represents. And this is the first lesson, really, of N of 1 trials. They are incredibly powerful at teasing out individual response to treatment, but by the same token, they warn us that other trials can't do it. And a personal hobby horse of mine is the extent to which people, people keep on banging on about the importance of personalized and precision medicine without admitting a fact which is really known to all statisticians once they stop to consider it, is that we don't really know what proportion of response that we see in clinical trials is truly personal simply because we don't run the sorts of clinical trials which would enable us to see it. We need to have models which have suitable components of variation in them and we need to have designs which are suitably rich in measurement. If we don't have that, then we can't actually tell who responds and who doesn't. Now I'm going to give you a simulated example, and I'm going to have a look at various analyses of this example. I'm going to imagine that we have 12 patients suffering from a chronic, rare respiratory complaint. For example, we could imagine cystic fibrosis. Each patient is randomized in three pairs of period, comparing two treatments A and B. We're also going to have an adequate washout in the design. And so if you've been keeping track, then in that case, we're going to end up with 72 observations altogether because we've got 12 patients. And each of the patients is going to be studied in three cycles. And in each of the three cycles, we're going to have two measurements. In fact, we're going to measure efficacy in terms of expiratory volume in one second, which is a very popular measure in pulmonary studies. So the question is, how should we analyze such an experiment? So here is a possible representation of the data. This is a trellis plot. Each of the rectangles represents one of the patients. Each of the blue points represents one of the cycles for that patient. And what I have done here is I have plotted the difference, treatment B minus treatment A, against the difference from the second cycle, rather. Uh, sorry, I'm wrong. Uh, let's start again. What I've done is for each cycle, what I've done is I've plotted the result for treatment A against treatment B, or rather treatment B against treatment A. So the three points represent the three pairs of values that I would see from the particular uh, cycle. Each point represents a pair of values, sorry, and the three points represent the three cycles for one patient. I've also included a red asterisk, and that is the average value under A, or the average value under B, rather, plotted against the average value under A. 
And what you should be able to see from this particular trellis plot here, each trellis plot, by the way, each rectangle has a line of equality. So most of the points that you should see are to the left and above the line of equality. And what that means is that the response under treatment B was better than under treatment A. Had it been the other way around, then in that case, most of the points would have been to the right and below the line of equality. The asterisk, as I say, shows the mean response. And what we've got here is we've got immediately, I think, in presenting the data in this particular way, we can see that for this particular simulated example anyway, it looks as if there is an overall average treatment effect. Treatment B seems to be better than treatment A. But before we proceed to analysis, I want to remind you of possible objectives of an analysis in clinical trials because I think these objectives are often forgotten. So we could be interested in the following question, the following fairly simple question, it seems. Is one of the treatments better? This is the sort of thing that classical significance tests were developed to answer. And of course, such tests, as we all know, are often criticized. Nevertheless, they are an attempt to answer this very simple question. Can we just say that one of the treatments was better than another? What can be said about the average effect in the patients that were studied? So can we say, actually say anything about the average effect in the patients that were studied? This is often, I think, misunderstood as being a meaningless question because it's just a matter of descriptive statistics. It's not a matter of descriptive statistics because in actual fact, in a standard clinical trial, all that we've done is randomized patient to one treatment or another, and we don't actually know that the observed effect is the true effect for these particular patients. So it is an interesting question to know what the average effect in the patients were that were studies. We'd like to have estimates and confidence intervals for that. In other words, we can imagine that the randomization might have been carried out otherwise. Had the randomization been carried out otherwise, we would have had a different estimate so the estimate that we see is not necessarily a statement of the average effect, even in the patients that we've studied. Getting more ambitious, what can we say about the average effects in future patients? And we could look at that in a number of ways. What can be said about the effect of a given patient in the trial? And what can be said about future patients not in the trial? Another thing we need to remind ourselves about is two different philosophies, which are sometimes rather loosely and exchangeably used by statisticians. On the left-hand side, I've got the randomization philosophy. The patients in a clinical trial are taken as fixed. The population about which the inference is made is all possible randomizations. We consider that we might have run the experiment otherwise. We think about the um, results that we've seen. And randomization is actually what makes the stochasticity in the particular problem. We're not using an error measurement model here. We're just saying, let's imagine the values themselves were fixed, but we could have seen them under other treatments. What sort of treatment estimates would then come from that particular thought experiment? And this, as we all know, is the sort of point of view that leads to permutation tests, for instance, as a way of looking at clinical trials. Uh, this particular approach is rather rarely used, but it's one that most statisticians know about. This particular form of analysis requires fewer assumptions, but as I've said at the bottom there, as I've already said to you, this approach is rare. If we look at the right-hand side, then we have the sampling philosophy, and the patients are regarded as a sample. But actually, statisticians are usually very vague as to what sort of a sample they might be regarded um, as, a, as representative of, or what sort of population, rather, they might be regarded as being a sample of. But we sort of imagine that the population of relevance is some possible population of patients. Usually, we describe stochasticity by a model in which we add some error terms. This particular approach is much more ambitious, and this approach is much more common. So if you're in the habit of using mixed models, or even if you're in the habit of using uh, ordinary least squares, or if you're in the habit of using a standard t-tests or whatever for analyzing your clinical trials, then effectively you're doing something a bit like this. Although it turns out under certain circumstances, the answer are very similar, 
to what you would obtain from the randomization philosophy. And this is perhaps one reason why the two frameworks are sometimes blurred. So I now want to draw your attention to a paper in PLO01 by Chen and Chen, 2014. And they considered appropriate analyses of N of 1 trials randomized in cycles. And what they did was they compared the approaches in the way of a simulation. Uh, and one of the approaches that they, they considered was simply to treat all of the various cycles as if they were pairs in a match pairs test. And they found this performed well. Now, I can tell you that my very first reaction on seeing this was this is wrong. It has to be wrong because what you're doing is you're treating all of the pairs as if they were exchangeable. Effectively, you're assuming that the n, if you like, the sample size that you have is the number of pairs and not the number of patients. And there's something wrong about the way in which components of variation are treated. So I'm now going to have a look at this particular analysis and see whether it can be justified in any way. And to do that, I'm going to go back to my questions. And I'm going to ask the question, is one of the treatment better? And I'm going to use significance tests, but in the way in which they're particularly associated with the Rothamsted School. And here we can mention leading statisticians who developed it, such as Fisher, of course, Gates, John Nelder, and Rosemary Bailey also. But these are the four names I think of as being particularly associated with this school of inference. They developed analysis of variance, not so much in terms of linear models, but in terms of symmetry. And a high point was John Nelder's theory of general balance in 1965, which is not a paper I pretend to understand properly. In fact, my opinion is that probably the only person who's ever understood it properly is Rosemary Bailey, but there we are. So the way in which general balance works is like this. You establish and define the block structure, first of all. That is the fundamental structure that exists, in a sense, in the experimental material before you get to work on it, and which, in some way, you're going to both exploit and take account of. You also establish and define the treatment structure. Given randomization, the analysis then follows automatically. And in fact, this particular approach is incorporated in GenStat, not surprisingly, since John Nelder, who was really the person who first established this algorithmic way of proceeding, was the, the, one of the prime movers in developing GenStat. So the block structure within GenStat is patient slash cycle. And those of you that use SAS, I think it's patient with cycle in brackets within SAS. The treatment structure here is very simple. It's treatment. So this is the particular structure of our experiment here. We have randomized the patients in cycles. That's what we have to say first of all. Then we have to say what we're interested in here. And here it's very easy. We're just interested in studying the effect of treatment. And then we can point a package like GenStat. But when I say a package like GenStat, as far as I'm aware, it's the only package that does this at the data, and the analysis will follow automatically. So here is the general balance approach in um, GenStat. The block structure is declared as being patient, cycle within patients. The treatment structure is declared as being treatment. I've called my FEV1 value Y, and then I simply ask for analysis of variance, and it is produced. So those three treatments, treatments, three statements together, sorry, produce the analysis of variance. Notice a particularity about GenStat. Although it, it produces the variance ratios, what some people call F statistics, and although there are three of them, it only gives you p-value for one of them. That's because the block structure is something which exists in the experimental material. You can't talk about causal effects applied to block structure. You can only talk about causal effects applied to treatment structures. And sure enough, it gives you a p-value for the treatment structure. Here we have a variance ratio of 50.57, which is clearly significant. We don't need to have the, um, the formal p-value quota for us to do that. But it's clearly significant. And that effectively reflects what we already saw by looking at the trellis plot earlier. But the interesting thing here is, then this is really quite surprising, or it might be surprising, is that this turns out to be equivalent to the match pairs approach using the 30 seat cycles to provide the pairs. It's absolutely equivalent to that particular approach. 
And just to prove it, here is the uh, match pairs T using cycles to define pair using that particular command within GenStat. This gives me a T statistic, which is 7.11, but 7.11 squared gives me 50.57, which is exactly the variance ratio I had before. And as we all know, the square of a T statistic is an F statistic. The degrees of freedom are the same. These two analyses are formally equivalent to match pairs T and the analysis of variance using the block structure and John Melder's theory of general balance. So consequences. The match pairs T test examined by Chen and Chen is a valid analysis. So this is maybe a surprising result which comes out from this. It's justified by the randomization theory of the Rothamsted School and by John Melder's approach, but you have to be very careful. It's a valid analysis for testing a very specific null. And this specific null is that the two treatments are identical. In this case, under the null hypothesis, the interaction is zero. And that justifies, in a sense, using this particular analysis. We don't need to worry about a further component of variation because under a strict null, which says it literally makes no difference whatsoever to any patient, whether you give them B or whether you give them A, then in that case, there can be no interaction term we need to take account of. It also raises the question, can we do better? And the answer is yes. We can go one step further and remove the treatment by patient interaction from the residual sum of squares. And what's the justification? Well, the justification is as follows. Under the null hypothesis, the expected value of the interaction is no different from the residual. But if the alternative is true, we can use a smaller residual sum of squares. If this seems wrong, then I'd like to point out that it's analogous to the following idea we use all the time when carrying out a two-sample t-test. When we have a two-independent sample t-test, under the null hypothesis, the two groups are the same. So that means we could actually use a variance estimate using n1 plus n2 minus 1 degrees of freedom rather than using n1 minus 1 plus n2 minus 1, which we commonly use. The reason we use n1 minus 1 plus n2 minus 1 for our degrees of freedom, having separately estimated the variance within each group rather than pooled across the groups, is because we, we know that it's better under the alternative hypothesis. So precisely because under the alternative hypothesis, it would have been better to remove the interaction, I can do that in this particular analysis. And when I do that with the analysis of variance here, then what you find is the following. Again, GenStat refuses to give me uh, F statistics for the block structure, but it now gives me two variance ratios or F statistics, one for treatment and one for patient by treatment interaction. That particular variance ratio is only 1.22 and it's not significant. This, by the way, is not a reason, in my opinion, for using the simpler model. I don't like the general approach of using a test to decide whether to pool uh, degrees of freedom or not. I would prefer that one had decided beforehand how one should proceed. So if I had decided to proceed in this particular way, I would actually carry on uh, as I intended. And in fact, I would get a reward because the variance ratio of 54.13, I think, if I'm not mistaken, but maybe I'm wrong, let me go back. Yes, the variance ratio is slightly higher than it was before. Of course, I've lost some degrees of freedom in doing that, so I'll have to enter the F table at a less advantageous place. But nevertheless, this is the analysis I would stick with having chosen this. If I compare the two models in SAS, this is using PROC-GLM. This is what SAS gives me. The second approach, by the way, it turns out, is identical to fixed effect meta-analysis with one little proviso, which I will discuss in due course. The first is without a patient by treatment interaction. So if we have a look at the fixed effect, uh, if we have a look at this particular analysis here, what we get is we get again within SAS 54.13 for the variance ratio for treatment, 1.22 for the interaction, but it also gives us the um, variance ratios for patient and patient by cycle, and that is because there is no way in SAS, as far as I'm aware, for it to know that one set of terms are treatment terms and the other set of terms are block terms. 
and it's not using a theory of general balance here in order to derive the analysis. The analogy to fixed effect mat and meta analysis is as follows. The total degrees of freedom that we have for error are as given in the table at the right. So I've given them numerically for our particular example, and I've also given them according, uh, in general. So the source here, we had patient, there were 11. That's uh, one fewer than the number of patients. Cycles within patients. Well, we had three cycles within the patients, but we've got to remove one degree of freedom for that, and we've got M patients, so we end up with 24 altogether. Treatment, of course, has one. Treatment by patient has 11. Residual has uh, 24, and that gives us a total of 71. But if we treat each patient as a trial with K pairs, we have K minus 1 degrees of freedom for each patient, and this gives us exactly the same total. And so therefore, the analysis is equivalent to a fixed effect meta-analysis. And there's one proviso, however, provided we pool the variance estimate. The usual way in meta-analysis is that we estimate the variance separately within each trial. The fixed effects meta-analysis recipe would be as follows. Calculate the difference as B minus A for each patient. Calculate the mean difference for each patient as an estimate of the treatment effect delta I. Calculate the degrees of freedom for each patient. Calculate the corrector sum of squares for the differences for each patient. Sum the corrector sum of squares over all patients. Divide these by the total degrees of freedom to obtain an estimate of the variance sigma hat squared. So that's a difference from meta-analysis. I'm actually using a pooled estimate of variation across all of the patients rather than independently within each patient, and I'll justify that shortly. For each patient, produce an estimate of the variance of the treatment effect as sigma hat squared divided by Ki, where Ki is the number of cycles we've seen for that particular patient. Then use the estimates of the treatment effects and their variances as input to a fixed effect meta-analysis. As I say, one important difference to conventional meta-analysis, in a conventional meta-analysis, the variance would be estimated independently within each trial. Here, a pooled variance has been used. And the reason is, we have so few degrees of freedom that we really can't estimate the variances very well if we use um, them independently with, for each patient. And um, I've got a little slide to follow which shows you how bad things can be if you have very few degrees of freedom. Here it is. What the slide shows you is the probability of the variance ratio between the patient who posts the highest variability to that who posts the minimum variability being at least 10 to 1. How many patients do we have to have in a series of N of 1 trials before we would see a variation of at least 10 to 1, even though actually, truly, but unbeknown to us, variability was actually the same for every patient. And this particular diagram gives it for the case where the degrees of freedom are equal to 2, which was the case that we had, or the case where the degrees of freedom will be equal to 4, which would be a design run in five cycles. And you can see that as soon as we have four patients, then in that case, we can expect a ratio of 10 to 1, even though there's no difference between the patients. Now, the consequence of this would be that we would start weighting information from different patients by observed information, and that would be an extremely bad idea. We would have the idea that somehow one particular patient had been estimated much more precisely than others, and we would weight them unequally. And this is why here, we need to take care to make sure we don't produce our variance estimates in this particular way. By the way, it's also a problem for conventional meta-analyses when one is combining lots of small trials. So perhaps a lesson to take home here. Two more difficult questions we might consider. The average effects in future patients. This might require a mixed effects mo model. Allows for random treatment by patient interaction and also the average effect in a given patient. Same random effects model can be used to predict long-term average effects for patients in the trials. So two simple analyses, just to remind you. Um, here we've got, uh, well, the one on the right we haven't seen yet. By, based on 36 pairs, the one on the left, by the way, we've got a standard error of 26.539 uh, when we use 36 pairs. 
an alternative way of proceeding, one that perhaps many uh, statisticians might find more natural, would be to reduce all of the data to 12 averages, first of all, uh, one for each patient, and then analyze these 12 averages. And that would give us a rather different result. We get a slightly different standard error. Why do we get the higher standard error? That's because there is a little evidence, not conclusive, but a very little evidence of an excess of variation in the trial so that patients respond differently from patient to patient. And actually, of course, I know that there should be because I simulated the data, so I'm cheating there. Um, and this particular variation will contribute if we use this particular approach. So moving to mixed models, the previous approaches were two-stage approaches. First, reduce the data to meaningful contrast, and then a mean difference per cycle or a mean difference per patient. And the second stage is to analyze the contrast using a match pairs T based on 36 within cycle differences or based on 12 within patient mean differences. So a mixed model is an alternative. And in fact, provided there are no incomplete cycles, the following two approaches are equivalent. We can either model the whole data or a model for the differences. So the model is shown here. We have the response um, outcome. Uh, and we've, I've got on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, I've got a patient effect, which is random, and a cycle effect, which is random, within patient, within cycle error. And then finally, I have a treatment effect, which I assume is random, which is the tor I term. Now it turns out that if you have a design which is uh, balanced across cycles, then in that case, uh, you don't need to do this. Effectively, you simply reduce the information to uh, information <coughs> um, of differences. And that means that the first two effects on the right-hand side simply disappear. So lambda i and beta i are, are not needed uh, unless we have data in which we have uh, some patients treated in one cycle only, and we feel we want to recover this information. In that case, the, um, the result will simply use, re reduce to a, uh, a model in which only the epsilons and the tors are important as regards random effects. Strictly speaking, I should have some nesting operators here if I'm a little bit careful, but I ignored them. So if I do a solution for a fixed effect analysis here, then um, I get uh, this particular estimate here, um, which is a test for fixed effects. Sorry, this should really be on the, on the summary statistic. This is an analysis using the meta-analysis package in R. I was hoping here to demonstrate to you a fact I'm going to have to skip over, I'm afraid. I was hoping to demonstrate to you the following fact. You're going to have to take it on trust. And I fear that I may even have made a mistake in one of the slides that I loaded up. So I'm going to have to check that afterwards and correct that with you. But the conclusion this particular investigation um, brought me to is the following. And you're going to have to take this on trust that several different approaches to analysis give exactly the same estimate and standard error. And the question is why? And these are the three methods. You can start with a mixed model approach. If you do that, you estimate the two components of variation. And that's to say the variation within patients and the random patient by treatment interaction. And then afterwards, you add them together. If you use the summary measures approach, this comes out automatically in the wash the treatment estimates you have for each patient actually reflect the fact that the patients random, uh, vary randomly. And it also reflects the fact that you haven't studied the patients infinitely often. So both variances are already present automatically in the summary measures if you analyze just one summary measure per patient. If you use a random effect meta-analysis, but using the variances that the first stage analysis Producers, in other words, you start as if you were going to do a fixed effect meta analysis using that pooling variance that I approach that I mentioned, but you then say, no, no, I've changed my mind, do a random effect meta analysis instead. What it then starts doing is it starts having a look at how much the estimates vary amongst each other, and it comes to the conclusion that the estimates vary more than the values that you've given should suggest. And so what it does is it inflates it. And it turns out, and we have a paper that will be appearing, we hope, in PLOS 1 shortly, which shows exactly how these three things lead to the same analysis. 
If I want to produce some estimates for the uh, individual patients, then for this particular example, this is what happens. Uh, I can use the mixed model to shrink the various estimates. Um, and uh, what I've done here is I've got a plot where on the x-axis I've got the naive estimate, so that's simply what I would estimate for each particular patient. And on the x-axis I've got a shrunk estimate. The red line is a line of equality. The dashed horizontal line is the average effect for all of the results. And you can see that the blue points, each of which represent one of the um, 12 patients, have been tilted so that they are much closer to the dashed line than they are to the diagonal red line. This is because the um, this is because the uh, individual component in this particular set of data is not very strong. The interaction, the random subject by treatment interaction, is not very strong. The evidence for a strong personalized effect here is minimal, and so we can improve on the naive estimates by using, borrowing some strength from the overall average mean. And this happens to quite an extent here. Just out of interest, we also have an example where we reduced, uh, we got rid of some of the information. So we decided to do without uh, one cycle from patient 11 and for two cycles for patient 12. So patients 1 to 10 have three cycles and patients, uh, uh, patient 11 has two cycles and patient 12 has one cycle. And if I do that and I repeat the analysis, then you can see that the degree of shrinkage is much stronger for patient 12 than for the rest of them, and a little bit stronger for patient 11 than for the rest. And that's because I have less information on those particular patients. Of course, what this also tells us is that if I have another patient not in the trial and I have no information for that patient, then I have no choice but to use the horizontal dashed line as being my prediction for what will happen with that particular patient. And one may say, well, that's terrible. Why would we ever be in that position? But that's exactly the position we're in whenever we run a parallel group trial. We simply use the average effect as our prediction of what the effect would be for future patients. So these are the conclusions. And I apologize at the last bit, I had to go rather fast. And also, because I think there is a mistake in one of the slides, it's going to be rather difficult for you to understand. But just to give you the conclusions I have from looking at this particular subject, or that we have from looking at the subject. First thing to be clear about, different purposes justify very different analyses. And I think that considering N of 1 trials sheds some light on the longstanding controversy in meta-analysis between fixed effects and random effects. Proving that there is a difference between treatments, if it's your causal, causal purpose, it's randomization based. You can use a randomization based analysis and the fixed effect meta-analysis is equivalent to this particular analysis I showed you, where you have an analysis of variance, but you actually allow for the interaction. But a more ambitious purpose is to attempt with difficulty to estimate effects in patients and predict them for future patients. And for this, you need mixed models. You need shrinkage estimators, and you need random effect meta-analysis. And one further point I should say about this, to do well in shrinkage estimation, you need to have estimated the variance components well. We here have included a small example because it's easy for others to follow the analysis and do it. However, 12 patients in general doesn't give you really enough degrees of freedom to estimate the component of variance, which is the random patient by treatment interaction. Ideally, you would like many more. Thank you for your attention.